The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. You have uh, handouts here of 16th century vocal music and instrumental music. That's um, the one page outline, the rest is for next class. Uh, have out the thing that says, begins uh, Heinrich Itzak. This was, um, um, and then we'll open it to the Martin Luther piece. After that, have the Office of Sext out. We will do that about 15 minutes into the, 10 minutes into the class or so. And then um, the third packet you'll need is one that begins Il Bianco e Dolcicino. Okay, so this is uh, class 16. We left off last class looking at um, a little bit on the sec secular music of Germany, and we began with um, Heinrich Itzak's piece, um, Innsbruck, Ich muss die Glassen, right? And wh what were some of the characteristics of this piece? Do you remember looking at that? Uh, it was arranged twice, once with tenor melody and once with soprano. Yeah, yeah. So, so what, what were some of the main differences? Um, if we look at the, the range again, that. I have my copy here. Especially, we, we talked a bit about where the melody was located. What did the other voices do in the first version? Which, what do we call, the, what do we call that when the melody's in the tenor? This is a German word. Tenor lead. Tenor lead, yeah. Yeah, so just lead like, like you might have seen with Schubert leads, and leader, and stuff like that. What, what's the alto do in the tenor lead version? Echo. Yeah, it's an echo, imitation. Um, then notice one of the things is that all Look at the clefts of the top three voices. This, this is kind of something to really pay attention to. They're all, they're all sort of low-ish clefts. So this is sort of for, yeah, yeah, that's a, that top treble clef is actually treble 8 GB. So we're not, we're not talking this huge um, melody. Contrast that from, so that's from 1510 to the next piece, the next arrangement. As Lisa said, we have two different arrangements and here, we, we have something a lot closer to the modern SATB. So, soprano, alto, tenor, bass. So we have the, um, the top voice rarely crosses with the, in fact, does it ever cross with the alto? Yeah, oh yeah, yeah, we, we mentioned that in class, yeah. Vo ikiem a lind bin. Yeah, that one place where it confuses the melody. Uh, also note the, the alto is a little bit lower than we usually, um, usually go, isn't it? I mean, especially in the ich fahr doch in mein Strassen. Yeah, yeah it's, a, it's, it's only barely better than the last one, though. It's only better. The last arrangement really like goes to E down there. This one goes to like F. Yeah. Soprano was certainly not like this. But, but remember, we're still in the period where we don't know exactly what you know. I mean, what maybe yeah. Maybe this is A. Maybe that was A. Maybe that. If um, let's see, what's that, that that makes things better, right? Yeah. Yeah. So if this was. If this was A, then I'll do it. We also, we're in the period where we don't know for any given piece whether um, we have women singing or we have boys or we have uh, adult men who have trained to sing high. Um, so there's a lot of, lot of unknown questions for the performance of any individual piece. And we saw um, when we looked at, remember the piece that we looked at with the French piece, where we looked at the original prints and we looked at some of the performing ensembles for that piece. Yeah, what, what was it? What was the question? The, the, the French piece that we looked at with, where we saw some of the uh, arrangements and performing ensembles, and we saw that women played an important part in the performance of those, of some of them. Okay, we haven't all been doing our reviews, that's why I just sort of yeah, stimulate. <laughs> there, there's a brain cell back there that's holding, that's holding this important piece of data, and you come back out, tant que vivre. Yeah, 
we'll, we'll take, take a little bit of time these, these next couple weeks as, as there's one class per week for most of the weeks and just, you know, go back and just, just play through these pieces and be like, right, right, you know, that, uh, that's, that's good to have in your head all semester and not just when we do it and at the, at the exam. It's great. So, so we've gone back and we've looked a little bit at, at Itzhak. Now, go on and continue to the next, next piece in the packet. And we'll um, look at this um, composer, perhaps in quotation marks, uh, Martin Luther. And Martin Luther's Protestant Reformation, um, you guys basically all, all know something about you know, nailing theses to a wall of a church and saying that you, know, you shouldn't be able to pay your way out of, out of hell and purgatory. You should, you know, and things, things like this, and, and for him, you know, I should be able to marry this cute nun that, uh, that I've been attracted to, which he eventually does. You know, all these things that, that, ha that go into uh, the Protestant Reformation. But one of the main things that for us that's important is uh, change to a simpler vocal style. And a, and a musical style that takes some of the simplicity of the music of Itzhak, for instance, that we're looking at. Um, and so we can hear some of the simplicity in a chorale that, a chorale melody, a simple melody for people to sing as a group that, uh, that he's arranged, that he's put together, that he's written words to, and um, perhaps he's written the music to, not, not entirely sure. Um, Ein feste Burg ist unser Gott, uh, a mighty fortress is our God. There's, um, there's a famous story of Martin Luther composing this, um, or arranging this piece by taking um, a drinking song and writing new words to it, where, um, where he said something like, Warum soll der Teufel alle die gute uh, Lieder haben? Why should the devil have all the good songs? And taking it back. Uh, unfortunately, uh, this is something I learned in my music history class, and uh, it, apparently there's no truth to this, or, or there's, nobody's been able to document that this used to be a drinking song. But let's listen to the first version. Um, here it is in Luther's edition of, of psalms and hymns and um, things like that. And you'll see um, he's written it in slightly different, it's a slightly different version from what you have here, but it's very similar. And it's this um, single impression. Actually, this, this is a rather nice um, music print, a lot, lot less jaggedy than some of the other ones we've looked at. But um, you see a single melody going across. And let's, you can either follow along here and see what the difference is between this and your version, or follow along in the score for a second. <laughs> that setting to a slightly, probably a slightly later setting, though published at the same time in 1529 by Johann Walter, another composer, a professional composer, who's going to take this melody and um, put it into, um, well, into a more tenor lead fashion. So go ahead and look at your score and find the melody in the tenor. Da, 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 da. And um, let's listen to about that much of the four-part version. I'm <laughs> Here it's not completely unelaborated. They still have that uh, soprano, those runs and things, but it's a little, a little less ornamented than some of the 
Um, well, certainly it doesn't have any of the intellectual sophistry of like the Missa Pulazione of Johannes Achigem with four different time signatures going at the same time and things like that. Um, And in fact, some of the other Protestant groups that were to arise soon, the Calvinists, and went further on the austerity side. But there's always, you know, when, when one new group arises with a new idea of music, there's always, yeah, as Zachary's as, as gesture shows, there's, there's always has to be a counter reaction. And basically, um, you know, like, uh, I don't know if, if Stanford started offering, uh, you know, $200,000 free scholarship to every student, they're going to start attracting new people. And, and Luther is offering some really great things. I mean, you don't have to pay to get out of purgatory anymore. Fantastic. You can, you can be a priest and you can marry. That's even better. Um, all, all these good things. And so the Catholic Church begins to lose um, some of their uh, some of their followers, some of the people. And so, uh, what are some of the things that they can do? Well, one of the things musically that we care about is there can be a renewed emphasis on the simple, on things that that, that have always worked, and not not the new weird stuff that's going on. So it's a renewed emphasis on plain chant in the. Catholic Counter-Reformation of the 16th century. So that's why we're delaying a little bit singing uh, sext until now. Let's remember that that um, chant is the most important musical form still going on by, by singing it. And um, so we're going to sing the Office of Sext for, for Tuesday, which is pretty appropriate since it's uh, almost noon and, uh, and Tuesday. And who's, um, who's our Abbot or abbess today, I Lisa? Think, I think I'm an abbot. Great, great. And uh, Cantor? Okay, this will make C. Is that pretty good for C today? So, um, sure. or, yeah, go ahead. Domine festiva. Gloria Patri et Filio et Spiritui Sancto, sicut erat in principio et nunc et semper, et in saecula saeculorum. Amen. Alleluia. Recto potens redax Deus, cui temperas reum vites, Splendor emane instruis, et in nibus meridiem. Extingue flammas litium. Let's keep the temple up. Alpha calor unoxium, confessa lutem corporum, veramque pacem cordium, presta pate piissime, Patrique coparunice, cum spiritu paraclito, regnans per omnes seculum. Amen. Ad spice in me, et miserere mei domine. Mirabilia testimonia tua, Ideo scutate est ea anima mea. No, come on, come on. We, this one always grabs us. Et intellectum dat parvulis. spiritum. Qui mandata tua desiderabam. Alpice imi et miserere mei. Secundum judicium diligentia nomen tu. Resus meo spiritum secundum eloquentiam tu. Es non domine tu meo missim justitia. Redime mea comis homino. Ur custodia mandata tua. Fac 
Lucium tua illumine super servorum tuum. Et totem e justificationes tuas. And right back to the antiphon after this. Et in secula seculorum, amen. God speech in me, et misere re me domine. down very nice so yeah one of the things you can do is you can emphasize that um, you know that the, the chant will become a bigger part of the musical service you can also emphasize that the priests should know exactly how to do chant and how to do how to run a mass and how to run an office and so we begin to get these um, publications of more books that are telling you exactly how you should um, how you should conduct your your services for specifically for priests and we own two of them here at MIT which is how we can get these photos and things like that and which Julie is working on right now for her paper so it's great well um, because I don't know everything that's in this book except that there are wormholes and things like that um, but um, but you can see a couple things here one it's published in MD 1550 60 76 in Venice, Venetis. And we can see here um, this is the Summa Nuper Curia Juxta Sancti Tridenti Concilii. After the, the way of doing things after the Council of Trent. After this big council that comes up to try to make sure that the Catholic Church is responding properly to the um, to the to the sort of the the what would you say the the opportunities you could say the the problems presented by the Protestant Reformation and if we look through we can see things uh, like little things like how you should sing the requiescant in pace properly and we don't always do that right and how an amen da, da, da. I mean you can kind of imagine that if a priest needs to be taught how to sing amen there was probably some pretty bad singing going on in various places um, let's see 
we can we can see various things that um, that maybe we should maybe I don't know in future years I should I should consult this and try to do more and we should try to do not only the office of sex but the office of sex as it would have been done in Venice during the Counter Reformation because there are all kinds of things in these red marks that tell you exactly what a priest should be doing during it for instance we say and it Finito sacerdos dicat alta voce. And finally, the, the, the priest says in, and the problem with alta is it either means loud or high, and we don't really know. Probably loud, you probably don't want, uh, it says pater noster, we probably don't want the priest going pater noster, but really pater noster, um, and things like that as we're going through. And we can see that there's even, um, tells you when to do dominus vo. Vobiscum. Yeah, they're at least they're at least well educated enough to know what goes after vo et cum spiritu tuo. So so we can learn a lot by looking at uh, what we have here. The other, the people who are are the first people who are threatened by the Protestant Reformation are obviously the Catholics. Who then is threatened by the Counter Reformation? Well, a lot of people, but. For our purposes, it's important to think about the people who are writing that really complex music that is now sort of out of style, and that's the polyphonic composers. Um, let's, let's step back a bit and review and think about some of the, the music that we've looked at so far in this class. How many voices at a time, how many different parts are in, say, Nono Sulmante by Jacopo de Bologna? Maybe two. Yeah, that particular one was two. And go to four. Yeah, so, so then if we look at Dufay, we were getting four, like in Nupur, Rosar, and Floris. We had the two higher voices and the two paired bottom voices. It actually stayed at four for a lot of what we were looking at. We've, we've sort of, in this class, um, not done that, that much, any bigger pieces, but basically we start getting more and more six voice pieces, and then eight voice pieces, so even twelve. Um, no, actually, in, in yeah. some... When, when we were counting the four voices in the 14th century, some of them were optional, or some of them uh, not optional, you can choose one or the other part. But when we get to, um, into the 16th century, we start seeing some mass pieces, some motets with eight, 12 voices, and where we get uh, just the text is everywhere. And so the story goes, this guy Giovanni Palestrina, who um, is really unusual for all the people that we've studied who um, who worked in Italy in that he was Italian um, and not, not somebody who came, not an emigre. Um, he was in some ways, according to another one of these legends that we're not sure if it's really true or not, uh, was sort of got wind that the Catholic Church was going to ban all polyphony because uh, as part of the Counter-Reformation. And according to legend again, he creates a mass, the Missa Papa Michelis for Pope Marcellius, uh, that is that was so clear even though it had so many voices and that you could understand the text that you could really be sure that you were still singing to God even though it was such a such a complex piece. So we're going pretty quickly to get um, through through a lot of music today but we can we can look at what the Counter-Reformation's response to what's happening is through one of his pieces. We won't look at the Missa Papa Marcelli. We'll instead look at um, another one of his pieces. Uh, we'll actually look at two pieces. First, a motet by him called the Missa, uh, the, so the motet Tuas Petrus. And so go ahead and turn to that from 1573. And then a mass based on this motet. So it's after Timor et Tremor, which we'll get back to um, when we do some really cool chromatic stuff in about four classes. Um, now, let's just listen to the opening of Tuas Petrus and get this back in our heads. Actually, I have to plug in. So let's just listen to that much. Um, 
I don't know. I always think that if you're trying to convince some people that, that no, really, six voice uh, polyphony can be very clear and easy, and, and you expect them to have an attention span of a fly, what might you do at the beginning that he does Just here? Not put them all in together. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> three voices here, the three highest voices, then the three lowest voices coming in here. What, um, and just let's uh, wait, don't shout it out, just wait till we all have the answer ahead. What, what do we call, will we call the texture, the, how the, the words are set in this, um, in this section? So just, when you have it, how, is it contrapuntal or what? So do the syllables line up with each other or are they separate? So what, what do we call that? Anybody now? Roughly homophonic. Homophonic, homophony, where you have, not monophonic, not one part, but as it's roughly homophonic. I mean, you, there are things like that super honk, honk, that, you know, that, that aren't exactly like that, but it's roughly there. The text for this piece, tu es Petrus, you are Peter, it's super honk Petrom, and on this rock, uh, what is it, edificabo uh, ecclesiam? Yeah, ma'am. Uh, I will build my church. This is um, kind of a pun that Jesus gives to uh, Peter, um, naming him Peter and saying that he's going to build because he's the rock on which the church will be built. Uh, if we go to the interior of St. Peter's Basilica, is in the Vatican, St. Peter's Basilica, um, we see at the very top um, here, inscribed to us Petrus. So it's one of the most important uh, texts in, uh, and here's where the, um, this wonderfully ugly, grotesque altar where the Pope can preach and things like that, and it's right there. And the, the idea of who is Peter um, in the Catholic Church, anybody who follows this to the Pope. the Pope, yeah, because According to tradition, Jesus gives the keys to heaven to Peter, who gives it to the second pope, who's that, Linnaeus or something like that, who gives his third pope and it's handed all the way down. And that's why there's the keys in the mitre of the um, symbol of the pope, because uh, pope is Peter who has the keys to heaven. Um, so that's, that sort of gives something about what the, um, how this, how this, pieces text or where it comes from. But let's listen, um, let's just listen a little bit more to how the four part style goes in here. And we'll hear what, what's the technique that we heard, um, we heard a lot of homophony in Joss Can, right? There, so these homophonic sections we've heard earlier. What's the other thing that Joss Can does a lot of just um, in terms of how how he brings variety into a longer piece, longer motet, like the Ave Maria, Virgo Serena that we looked at. Yeah, go ahead. Like imitation. Yeah, imitation. Now, how long was it imitation? Was it like a kachia to go all the way through? No, it was, yeah, we call these things little points of imitation. See if, there, see if we can hear any of these things going on here. There, it's not, not a huge, huge number because that would be a little, maybe considered too intellectual, but let's, let's Keep listening for a little bit more. Measure twenty in case. Imitation, yada dee da dee, yada. And again, there's that that cheap 
form of imitation that we talked about mm -hmm. with Josquin, where it sounds like it's imitation, da 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 da, but in fact, your other voice has stopped singing by the time you do it, so you don't actually have to write counterpoint against it. This is not at all to say that Palestrina or Josquin couldn't have written counterpoint against um, something that they had just written as a point of invitation, but that this is a way of thinning out the texture and making it a little bit clearer. So we'll stop uh, listening there. Please listen to the, the whole motet, or the whole first part of the motet that's given. Uh, it's a really, really beautiful piece. Uh, with Palestrina, compare this to um, maybe to the tenor lead, but especially to Tonka Vivre, where we, remember we, with Tonka Vivre, you didn't have the piece in your head, but maybe remember the exercise where we sang through one of the parts, the soprano, and it was very melodic. We sang through the tenor, it was pretty melodic. Sang through the alto, a little less melodic, and then we sang the bass, right? <laughs> da, 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 something like that. Look here, how, is there differentiation in the voices? Or, Actually, sorry, of course, it's a contrast, of course, it's a rhetorical question. I hate when I do that. No, there isn't. Uh, but, but let's look at specifically at how little differentiation there is. I mean, if we were to, let's, let's choose a passage sort of at random and sing sort of each part of it. Maybe, um, uh, well, let's just compare like measure 15. We'll sing the top part. Um, we'll sing it on pitch a little bit. Um. Probably want to sing that low here unless you have that high G. So men, <laughs> women up here. If anybody wants to go up here, go ahead. But ready? And uh, we're starting, the final syllable is the trom of petrom. Okay, ready? Tromedificabo ecclesia. Yeah, so we have that that leap. Da, 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 da. Kind of a bass like motion, but we also have the melodic ya da da da. Now let's look at, let's do the third part there, what's labeled altus. And then we'll, we'll sing that. Yeah, so a little, uh, actually less melodic interest maybe, but not, not huge, but uh, you know, as after the repeated G's, then it's a little bit of motion. And let's do, uh, let's do the bass part. Um, so in bass clef, everybody. Actually, well, actually, this is this is also going to bias it because due to our choose, choice of octaves, most of us will sing the bass part above the soprano, but that's okay. A, a, t, f, c, b, o, a, c, z, a, m, a, n. Yeah, so maybe I don't know. What do you what? What do you think? Is there any differentiation of voices? Is there a little, a lot? It's a little, it's a little. Yeah. And there's not going to be as much ornamentation in the two, those parts. Um, yeah, well, let's, let's check that. Runs. The runs happen. I think they like, happen quite as much. Yeah, boy. Don't some of us wish we were doing a statistical paper on where the runs happens? Uh, the, we actually have as a data set, uh, Palestrina writes 104 masses, 104 <laughs> masses, and they're all encoded into a computer now. So we'd be able to check that. But let's let's check. Let's just compare the number of runs in the top uh, the top part to the base. And um, so let's let's quickly scan through that. Well, let's, I, this is a great hypothesis. I've never actually thought of this, and you, you scared me for a second, because I'm like, oh, shoot. But, but let's, let's figure it out. So, um, top, actually, we'll do this. We'll, we'll go in parallel. Um, this side of the room, count the number of runs in Cantus 1, and, we'll, and this side count and do the, on the base, and we'll all come up with slightly different answers, because some of us will consider some things a run and some things not. But, um, when you have it, just jot it down on a piece of paper, and then we'll get the numbers. Um, I like this kind of hands-on thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Do we got it? Yeah. Something like that? How, how many do you have for the top part? I have seven. How many do you have? Eight. Nine. Nine. I got nine, but I, th I think we, we might be very generous in what we consider <laughs> yeah. a rod. Uh, go ahead. Um, I was a little conservative, but I got three. Three. Also three. Three, three. three. Yeah, that's, three you, that's right. Yeah, so. There are eight or so in the second voice, too. Okay, well, yeah, so, so we can, um, yeah, and we could probably go through all of them, but it looks like, uh, looks like Davies, at least in our very small unscientific survey of one piece, uh, there's, there's something to that intuition that there are still runs, so, so that in the bottom part, um, but there is, there is some differentiation of voices. But maybe not a huge, huge slot. Let's, let's turn our attention to a completely different piece that has no relation to what we just heard, maybe, or maybe not, and listen to the Kyrie of the strangely named Missa to S. Petrus. So go ahead, continue ahead. This is um, written or published about, about 15 years later. Here we go. <laughs> It's not really working today, but um, let me say a little bit. Do you hear a relation besides the relation of, yeah. of singing slower in one? Yeah. Um, let me say a little bit about, about some of the things. So what, what do we do? How do we take uh, a polyphonic motet and make the opening of a Kyrie? One thing you might um, see is what do we do? We take these top three voices at the beginning. We have this high, clear section, and we move this voice, the third voice here, down to the bottom part. And what else do we do? We swap these two voices here. And that's, that's kind of an interesting reason. What, uh, uh, just, one, just one second on this. Um, we swap them. And then we also, obviously, because there's Kyrie has a different accent structure than two S. Petrus, so you're going to break up some of the notes. There's also um, perhaps responding to criticism that there wasn't en were not enough runs in the bass. Uh, we have things like the Petrus gets filled in as, as a run. What, who knows why, why these things happen. Um, wouldn't it be great to know, to look through like all, I mean, we've encoded 104, I haven't, uh, somebody has encoded all 104 Palestrina masses, to start encoding the motets and then be able to figure out how in each case that there's a uh, uh, a borrowing, and maybe there are even ones that we don't know about yet. So, so there's a lot of work so we done. David, um, the, in, when the lower three parts come in, in the motet, they come in, in the same. Uh, they, they are imitating the top three parts, and they have the same um, relation to the top three parts as they do in the mass. So it's basically exactly imitating the motet from measure seven on. From measure seven on. From measure seven on. If you look at measure seven, it's just filled in some things in that part and that part. But, Two, three, four, five, six, seven. From measure seven on, it's imitating what part of the of the motet? Let's just make sure we all have. There are only three parts in that part of the motet. So the three in the motet, you have three top voices, and then you have you're coming from six measures, and you have the bottom three voices, and they come in from six measures. Can you say it a little bit more slowly for everybody? Because I've uh, from measures seven of seven, the curia, of the mass. Of, of the, seven of the motet. One, two, two three, four, five, six, seven. Uh-huh. Um, uh, so the second system to um, uh, measure twelve. Mm -hmm. It's roughly imitating um, the opening uh, the, of the mass is roughly imitating those that sequence of measures. So there's another way we can look at that as missing the first six measures of the piece and starting yeah. on measure seven. Yeah, because it's mm -hmm. basically the same. It, the, 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 Mm -hmm. Second six measures the same as the first six measures on the voice that we shuffled. Right. But what happens in the what happens in the um, in the mass in measure three here? Just as a uh, you get the the first three measures only. In fact, in fact, this is a bad uh, example because it doesn't it makes it look like nothing happens, like nothing enters in measure uh, in measure four. <laughs> 
to diffuse that. Mm. Yeah, so what, what do we have there? That's... Exact canon. Not exactly. Not exactly. Well, mm. for the first two measures, it's exact. So we have this, the opening of the, the lower three parts becomes the section of the top three parts, right? It becomes top three parts. And he's still cheating, sort of, because right. the bottom three parts peter out. Well, right, but... Uh, but, no but <laughs> <laughs> oh, jeez. Uh, okay, okay, let's recover, recover, recover. We've got to move on. Um, yeah, but one of the things that's interesting about that, does this texture occur in the motet composed first? And the fact that he's able to do this, have the, the three parts work against themselves, that is to say, sound at the same time as their opening, even if he has to let it peter out after a little bit, that still, um, still says something about, I don't know, the kind of contrapuntal thinking that's going on here. Um, Palestrina's Contrapuntal writing, the way that he structures voices against each other, became sort of the norm of um, music pedagogy later. That is to say that this was considered such the perfect way to write counterpoint that if you've taken um, species counterpoint, uh, sometimes some of you in the 301 in the first year um, theory class do a little bit of this. This is a musical style derived from, not exactly, but a lot of the, t the um, the music of Palestrina. And so he sort of considered this pure music ideal. Um, later we would call what Palestrina, the style that Palestrina composes in, uh, the prima practica, the first practice of music. As um, obviously he didn't call it that because he didn't realize that there would later be a secunda practica, a second practice that we'll get to toward the end of the semester. But uh, these are terms that you'll see come up um, often with with Palestrina. You'll also hear sometimes the term stile antico, the ancient style, which of course he didn't consider himself the stile antico any more than the Ars Antigua considered themselves the Ars Antigua compared to the Ars Nova, right? So all these terms, anytime you hear a term that says somebody is old, they probably thought of themselves as pretty new at the time. <laughs> Questions about what we're doing with this? Okay, we're actually making pretty good time. I think we might actually get to um, most of the things on the syllabus that say, um, if time, maybe. We've just listened to a really a purely vocal style. I mean, something that's very much designed for voice, but um, we've talked only a little bit in this class about some of the things that were happening in, um, in instruments. And uh, so I want to say a little bit about instrumental music in general at the, um, as before getting and looking at certain s specific instrumental pieces by Michael Praetorius. Uh, what we have here is a, a very beautiful book, uh, which I'll pass around a facsimile of here. It's a collection of dances. And uh, this particular collection was give, to be given as a gift to Marguerite of Austria, but um, she was currently in mourning, and so it was considered inappropriate to give a book of dances to somebody in mourning, unless you dyed all the paper uh, black and then wrote instead in gold and silver um, to put in all the notes. So it's a really beautiful book. I'll pass it around in a second. Um, but to say that doesn't really look like a great melody you'd want to sing from, does it? I mean, you can just hear, if that's C, what's the first note there? Uh, F. F, so something like F. <laughs> Not exactly the greatest melody ever. Instead, um, uh. what we get from this term boss dances, these were, these were interesting, what we might call, still from the class, tenors. These were interesting lower parts to be, um, to be performed, and above it, instrumentalists would improvise. And we've seen a number of times in this class pictures of people playing instruments, and the one thing that they generally have in common is they're not saying they're looking at music. Oops, uh, now let's, we'll look for viruses later. Um, and this, this 
book tends to say things like, um, well, in this case, um, what is this? Um, venise, uh, name of a dance, in L-V-I-I-I -I -I in uh, 55, 58 notes and six measures, um, everything perfect as you can see. And so it always, for some reason, it always says, you know, the, the beautiful thing in the number of notes and the number of measures, as you can see. So that might give you some idea of, of you know, trying to plan the, the extent of a dance, something like that. And then below it, there are all these things here. There's a, um, I think that's a R, B, S, S, D, 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 S, S, R, 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 R. And I used to know what all these things were, but these were the particular dance steps that, um, that you would do at the time. So you'd always begin with a bow, and then it would tell you to do some kind of movement forward and movement forward, and then double backwards and stuff. And you can kind of figure out what the movements are based on which one of them's always occur in pairs, or you know, which ones occur in triplets, things like that. It's a really, really interesting collection. And we have, um, we have also dance treatises. People who study dance history can, can work with you if you're ever interested in sort of having your own Renaissance dance party. And you can, you can basically um, you can look at some of the, um, the, the things that we're going to be looking at uh, with the Praetorius, which is later, and, um, and other uh, sort of music at the time to try to figure out what you might improvise above these. But I'll pass this around for now. This is some idea of instrumental music. What other pieces for instruments that we looked at? We looked at the Tonkia Vivre, because that originally started off as a purely vocal piece for four voices. And then we saw it, we heard it for four voices and lute, but we didn't really study that. We heard it for a solo voice and a solo lute. And then we saw it for, keyboard yeah, for a solo keyboard instrument. So um, remember with the keyboard music and stuff like that, there was, it was written out with a lot of um, ornamentation, a lot of, of things like, like that, a lot of um, ways of decorating the music. Um, so let's, but let's look at another collection of music, and I think of instrumental music, I find it really interesting. This is Michael Praetorius, who would probably, possibly uh, run and hide his head in shame if he knew that we were studying him entirely for this one little throwaway thing he did uh, toward the end of his life called Terpsichore, his only collection of instrumental music. But it stands as one of the very few collections of instrumental music in general of this period. Um, so go ahead and grab that out while I see where I threw it. My copy, ah, here we are. And it begins, um, it's after some of the madrigals here. And the first thing we see is, well, in your packet is this title page, right? Do you see if you can grab that? It's this thing that begins with uh, Il Bianco e Dolce Cino at the front. A little bit before that. A couple. It's I got be oh, I saw his name. Yeah, but it's it's before the pictures of the pretty musical instruments. <laughs> yep. And um, so Pretorius is um, he's in Germany, but he's writing what we can see from this. Well, first off, he uses this uh, calls it terpsichore. Anybody know who terpsichore is? The Muse of Dance, yeah, and so that, that says something. We can see from the title page here um, that this large thing, uh, one of the things that's interesting is they, they change fonts depending on the language. So here in German they write that there's some, some Französische, that there's, these are French dances and leader, dansen und Lieder on here. So I think he's kind of trying to pass these off a bit as French, and, and we'll see that some of them uh, may actually be. Uh, let's. Let's listen to his first piece, the Bronzo, um, the Bronzo Sampler. So this is the first of, what is it, 200 and, um, 200 plus odd dances that he was published in 1612. Let's listen to the Bronzo. Oops, actually. Um, we're renaming the Bronzo. Obviously, as always, percussion parts not notated.
so let's, sorry about that, uh, but gotta, you have a lot of music to get through. I kind of want to get still to the magical. I'm, I'm so excited that we might actually make it to the second, probably not have time, um, topic today. Um, so keep this out for a second. Well, I play, this is from 16, published in 1612, and um, Praetorius um, attributes this to some Francois Carbel that he's just sort of arranged stuff. But go ahead, keep this out while I play a little French popular song from the 1530s, uh, about the same time as Tonque Vivre. <laughs> Il est un homme en nos vides qui les a pas mes jaloux Il est même un jaloux sans cause mais il est coquille du tout Et la la la, je ne veux, 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 je ne veux Il n'est pas jaloux sans cause mais il est coquille du tout Il a même laissé la mer et au marché s'en va à tout now let's let's go back to the Praetorius and listen again. Let's just spread around it's, because you've, you've spoken a bit. Let's, uh, what are some of the connections between the song and the, um, and the dance, or what are some differences? The tempo sounds really different. The tempo sounds really <laughs> different, right. Now, do you think, uh, where, where does that discrepancy come from, probably? Well, probably the tempo wasn't really notated. They didn't notate it. Yeah, so the tempo wasn't notated. Um, does that mean that they had to be done in the same tempo? No, but doesn't, I mean, in fact, quite likely in 70 or 80 years, maybe the tempo that this piece would be cons performed in would, would change, but yeah, pretty definitely. Pretty difficult to dance at really high speed. Pretty difficult to dance at pretty high speed, but people would say it's pretty difficult to sing at pretty high speeds too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so not exactly sure. Uh, other differences? or similarities. Yeah, the phrases are of different lengths. The phrases are of different lengths. Let's let's um, look at the the opening phrase of the of the Bronze Ensemble and how what do we want to call the the phrase? Do we want to say or what do we want to count? Measures, quarter notes, half notes? What 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 do you feel like is is the determining thing? Measures are pretty simple to me. I, you might might call might say half notes, but but yeah. I mean, what, what do you what do you think you're going to be stepping to? Because you want to want to count numbers of left steps and right steps, and when you get back to your left foot, call that some sort of unit. Um, you know, bum 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 or bum bum bum. Probably, da, 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 da. probably stepping on the half note. Right? Yeah, yeah. So we should keep these things in mind. It doesn't really. For the purposes of this exercise, it doesn't matter too much what we count, but, but think about how, um, you know, for instance, if we count uh, measures, what happens in the second phrase? That might be um, a little odd to people who like dances. What's, what's the second phrase? What's the property it has that dances tend not to have? It's yeah, it's, a, it's an odd number of odd number of measures. So, so maybe measures might not be the best. But, but who, I, I'm not a dance historian. We, you know, we should bring one in and, and uh, know that. Speaking of that, uh, parentheses. You know, there's no class this Thursday uh, because of Veterans Day. Um, many of you will take advantage of the um, the extension on the paper granted to people who want to turn in Thursday, Friday, uh, to do that on Monday again. We at uh, five. And the connection is we do have a visitor coming, and that is Jane Alden speaking about uh, expensive facsimiles and whether they're worth um, the money just for the off factor, and uh, especially chansonnier. And we'll bring in some ones that we don't currently own that um, are far, far beyond the price range of anything we've seen in the class, and and talk about them. Um, just a remark. This is basically in my. Great, so we've moved back to the music. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. I was like, I was so. 
Have we seen it in minor? Like, like with a raised seventh. Yeah, so. Consistently raised seventh. Have we seen things in minor? Well, well we haven't. The sound like minor. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So we, we've, we've only first, we only started getting to pieces where it seemed appropriate to yeah. even talk about these mm -hmm. terms. But the one, the first piece that we felt it was appropriate was the, um, e, the Itzach, yeah. he, um, Heinrich Ikemusik Lassen, Innsbruck Ikemusik Lassen. And um, yeah, and we talked about that as being sort of, it felt like F major, even though there were some things that are different. Yeah, let's keep this in mind. Um, I think. It sounds like the of well, well, it even has a Picardy third at the end. Yeah, so the Picardy third, this raised major um, chord at the end of saying minor. Yeah, well, let's. Do you mind if we table that discussion for just a little bit because um, because we can we can look at whether or not um, when we look at, for instance, the uh, the song that's based on, we can see that it has a lot of the same characteristics, but all those sharps, all the F sharps are written above the staff, and what does that mean? Suggested They're suggested by the editor. So if a person wanted to make a real case that, well, this doesn't have the Picardy thirds, this doesn't have the, um, uh, you know, this doesn't have those raised leading tones, um, you know, it'd be here. But on the other hand, let's. L this is this kind of a neat exercise when we when we are doing our own um, editions of the Musica Ficta. We are you know trying to figure out. Who would have thought this? What sorts of evidence do we have that those F sharps um, might actually exist? And one of the pieces of evidence we do have is that somebody on, only 80 years later, well, it's, but you know, it's not that bad compared to only uh, 500 years later, only 80 years later had written in the F sharps in his own arrangement in the Praetorius one, right? So when you look at it there, the sharps are in the, are in the print, are in the original. We're jumping around a lot today, but I think it's I think it's kind of good, even more than usual. But um, good. What other 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 differences? So so you looked at uh, actually a similarity between the two. They both have similar modality. There's there's one that I um, I like to notice because of um, what I did with the arrows in Tuas Petrus. Let's, let's spread out around the contributions. Mm -hmm. The tenor of the song moves into the soprano? The tenor of the song moves into the soprano, yeah. Does the soprano move anywhere? Mm -hmm. yeah. I don't see it. I don't see it. OK. <laughs> and there, there's, some, there's a, a few things a little, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, oh, sorry. I thought you had your hand up for a second. What about, um, is it even possible to have a one-to-one -one correspondence of the voices from the one to the other? There are more voices. <laughs> there's no more voices. So even if you had, yeah. Well, you have two, uh, here in the, in the dance, it looks sort of like you actually have three voices. It's just that. Two, you have, you have sort of two pairs of voices which are moving in thirds at least two, in the beginning, and then you have one from middle voice. Right? Two pairs of voices moving in thirds at the beginning. Yeah, you. Although only for the first measure yeah. for the lowest two parts. So, so maybe, yeah. maybe, maybe not. Uh, it's um, yeah, because we do have. But, but what? What? Look, look at the bass part. Is it exactly the same in between both parts? No, no. In fact, so we have, so we have quite a bit of differences. Well, let me say something about this. This particular piece, it's a it's a body piece, like um, you know, like like so many of the pieces we have here. The text, uh, la la la, genolo, 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 dire, la la la, uh, a fake syllable just to fill things. I won't tell. I won't. I, I will never tell. Um, uh, uh, sorry, but, uh, sorry. I, I will tell. Je le vous dirai. I will tell you. I will tell you the story. Uh, il est un homme à notre ville. There is a man in our in our town, uh, qui de sa femme est jaloux, who is jealous of his wife. Il n'est pas jaloux sans cause. He's not jealous without cause. Mais il est coucou du tout. But he's completely cuckolded. That is to say, he's jealous, but but he hasn't figured out that actually she's you know. Got something on the side stuff, and so um, and so th this is the type of song that people like to do and like to laugh at a lot, and so it becomes a, a little dance here, and we, we looked at the differences in phrase length, and we looked at um, 
you know, all these, uh, these other things. And what's, what's interesting is that, again, many, many opportunities for research. Nobody, as far as I know, has systematically gone through the dances of, um, of uh, Praetorius and found whether or not there's actually orig more original French songs in that, um, behind them. There, there, others have been found, but there's not, there's not that systematic work, which is interesting because um, a lot of these dances and similar dances later became um, considered Icelandic folk music, and uh, all the way until the 19th and 20th century, and only now uh, there's an Icelandic scholar named Arne Ingolfsson, who's probably the most hated man in Iceland, because he's found out that all these things that for, for generations and generations were considered, uh, their Icelandic music was actually maybe the fourth voice of, of, um, of a French song of the 15th century, or maybe the third voice of, of a Praetorius dance or so. So there's a lot of these, uh, these connections that we can still make and we can still find. When looking at Praetorius, um, always comes up the question of what instruments we get to play this, right? And things and so um, and and even if we knew you know that this should be played on on a sackbut or on a on a, a sham you know what exactly what types and fortunately um, and one of the reasons there's not that much instrumental music out there but one of the reasons why of the music that instrumental music that is written down Praetorius has performed a lot is because he was also um, in his large sort of collection and description of everything about music in the world he produced these. Um, these images of instruments for the time. And so this is from his De Organographica about instruments from his Sintigama Musica of 1619, so um, about seven years later. And so we see in the first page, at the bottom there's, um, there's all these things about um, what the instruments are, um, tr trombones, he calls them here, the same as the modern German um, term. And you can see that some of the trombones are quite, are quite intricate. Um, if we continue to this next page, we have a lot of depictions of double reed instruments in the top right corner and bagpipes. I think these are um, really interesting and in showing exactly where each of the individual keys are on them. Continuing on, uh, we have a set of crumb horns on the next page, and uh, why are they crumb horns? So they just have these hooks. Why do they have these hooks? Because otherwise they wouldn't be crumb horns. It's sort of a self-fulfilling prophecy. The crumb horn, and you can see um, from the pictures, especially the one on the left here, that the crumb horn's basically a uh, oboe, or sham, that then you put a cap over the, um, the mouthpiece. This makes it easier to be, say, a wandering minstrel or somebody playing while, while moving because you don't have to worry about damaging your reed so much. Um, it keeps the reed um, about the same uh, sort of moisture, whether it's being played or not. It does make it incredibly hard to play in tune. The crumb horn may be the most difficult uh, instrument to play in tune. MIT has four of them if we ever want to get together and, and sound, uh, try to see what the, what the most uh, ugly sound we could possibly make. We could play it. On the other hand, when played well, the crumb horn is one of the most beautiful instruments there. Um, let's continue on with some nice pictures. We're going to be joined in um, two classes, I believe, or three classes, that's uh, two weeks from today, by um, a master lute player, Doug Freundlich. So we'll talk more about lutes and similar instruments then. You all will um, be given a piece for the lute written in this obscure notation that only lutenists read, and um, you guys will join that ranks and try to figure out how to figure out how to play music for the lute. Um, you can also see here that a lot of fretted instruments at the time of many, many strings. And we'll get to specific instruments in a bit. Um, on the page that says 22 at the top left corner, there's that instrument that we've, um, we've talked about a number of times in class, the hurdy-gurdy, which is sort of a crank violin that's played um, with a keyboard. Yeah, this has come up a couple times. But I really want to get uh, to some of these other instruments where he shows uh, exactly how organs are um, to be pumped at the time. And then the next page of your handout, um, one of my favorite, favorite pages in the entire book where he just has a picture of a ruler. 
And if you go back and flip back to the other pages for a second, you'll see that there's rulers at the bottom of about anything. This is beginning uh, the first really scientifically accurate um, depictions of instruments. And he talks about, on this page, about the importance of drawing things to scale and having instruments to scale and, and that, that the ruler at the bottom of each page changes in size to show the particular instruments on that page. So this is um, compared to what we saw um, in the Middle Ages and the early Renaissance, uh, much more scientific view of music of the time. But however, turn to the last page. Uh, I've lost mine. Where is it? And uh, I'll get it back. Uh, just look at those instruments. The, um, this is the opposite of the scientific view of the time. This is uh, a, a view of scholarship that we don't really take that um, sort of that, that good a, a view of anymore. And that is there are all these instruments depicted in the Bible that we have no idea what they um, actually looked like or sounded like. So we should draw them anyhow and just sort of make them up. And so you'll see that there's, there's hearts that, that would never actually work because they have no sounding boards that, that work properly. We have these, these instruments that seem to have three mouthpieces and four um, tone holes at the bottom, or four uh, bells at the bottom. So, um, so. It's like Esha. Yeah, it's a, it's a lot. It's a, it's a lot like Escher drawings. So let's, let's plan. Um, great. Uh, let's listen to a little bit of how uh, some of these instruments may have sounded in common, and listen to them uh, by uh, listen to these set of voltas on your own. And um, probably, if we have a little bit of time next class, we'll go through the instruments in general that are here. But we'll just listen for a little bit to get some of these ear instruments in our ear. Recorders. And what's the low instruments there? Yeah. Do you remember? Um, so we have some of these um, dulciers, which are kind of early bassoons. I think I think that might be going on here. This is a particular 20th century, 21st century recording ideal, I think, that you'll hear, we'll listen to one whole pe one whole dance, it takes about 45 seconds, and then you'll hear it segues really nicely into another dance, but listen to the instrumentation. Well, maybe we'll skip forward a bit, but. there was one extra repeat in this version. Actually, I'll just, we'll skip ahead a bit so you can hear. So as they switch to each dance, the ensemble transforms dramatically. The likelihood that this is actual performance practice is, is probably quite low. Um, I, it's not really something, you didn't have the Wolfenbüttel Philharmonic always at your disposal anytime you wanted to have a dance. But you can hear um, some of the different textures and different instrumental combinations that this performance uh, chooses to do. Here we have the little brass section. The, the one rule that we hear about a lot in um, instrumental music is that you don't mix loud and soft instruments. And loud instruments tended to include uh, a lot of things we wouldn't think of as loud today. Shams, which are, which are oboes, but they have much greater force. But again, like so many prohibitions, if it keeps getting repeated, probably it was happening from time to time. So you can hear a loud instrument section. So that gives you some sense of what's happening there. Let's, we have about five minutes left. Let's, let me tell you a little bit about the next uh, class's assignment. And we'll start, um, 
just get this tiniest taste of the one, one major genre of 16th century music that we didn't, we haven't gotten to so far, especially uh, vocal music, that's the madrigal. So next class, uh, the readings are just two chapters, uh, about 12 pages from the Wright textbook. This will give you an overview of just sort of English music at, at the sort of the, the lightest level, um, or, you know, just not, not that hugely deep, but we're going to spend four classes on England. So the following class will give, take a little bit deeper reading of certain aspects. So be a little prepared for that. Um, skim this early of six, this early uh, piece in sort of English music, um, King Henry VIII's pastime with good company, uh, just so you can sort of hear what's happened to English music since the last time we talked about England, which was when we talked about the continents and laws, the idea that English music was somehow influencing the continent. So you can hear a little bit what was happening then, but basically we're going to focus on English music at the end of the 16th and early 17th century, which will sound a lot like Italian music in the middle of the 16th century. So we'll, I'll put up this timeline um, very soon so you can see sort of how these, um, the time relates. Uh, but we'll listen to a piece from 1601, Thomas Wilkes, as Vesta was from Latmos Hill Descending, which is an English magical. In the four or five minutes we have left, let me just say a little bit about the madrigal since you've listened to it. Go ahead and grab uh, the packet that says Il Bianco e Dolce Cino on the front by Jacques Arcadelt, another one of these people who masters the, um, the Italian style without really being Italian. Let's listen, go ahead and turn to, um, turn to the opening of it and let's just... Um, We'll just listen to a little bit of what's happening here, a little bit of the music, and then I'll talk a bit about the magical. Let me say something about um, about the text of what we have so far. The, the verse is a very typical style of Italian verse that, um, and that is, the Ita we can tend to count accents in our uh, in, in English verse, right? You've heard of iambic pentameter. There's five accents that go yada 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 yada, etc. The Italians always tend to count syllables. And here, uh, it's seven and eleven are the two syllables that are all over Italian poetry. And this will become important in a little bit as we see Italian madrigal styles will sweep England. And all of a sudden we'll start writing English, um, English poetry in these Italian forms that just doesn't work for English, but they're quite, quite fun. So the Italians do everything in seven and eleven syllable lines. And here we have seven, seven, eleven. If you look at the second line of the... Uh, poetry, cantando more ed io. Um, that's pretty simple. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. The first line you have to learn how to count like Italians, and maybe uh, the way the Italians count. Uh, let's see, we're on camera. I was going to make a quip about the economy or something there, um, being influenced by inability to count syllables, but whatever. Now I have, anyhow. Um, because you want to count not il bianco. Il bianco e dolce cino, which would get you to eight. But you want to, in the beautiful Italian manner, elide as many vowels as you can. So il bianco e dolce cino gets you to seven. Or in the last line, uh, piangendo giung al fin del viver mio. Um, and even though there should, there's, uh, uh, there syllables are being left out in order to make it have. Um, 11 syllable lines. So that's the poetry here. Il bianco e dolce cino, cantando more ed io, piangendo giunto al fin del viver mio. But look at how um, Archidelt sets this. And, um, and this is really clear, um, making 
making music sort of be the servant of the meaning of the text. El Bianco e Dolce Cino, cantando... Sorry, I, I'm doing all this without giving you a translation. The sweet, uh, the, the white so, uh, sweet swan sings while dying, and I, crying, move to the end of my life approach the end of my life. So he sets not the white and sweet swan sings while dying and I crying move to the end of my life but as we would expect given the syntax the white sweet swan uh, sings dying and I crying move to the end of my life. The early Italian madrigal is an attempt to bring um, two traditions together. One is this tradition of easy to hear, homophonic often, um, transparent text settings that, um, that, we, that we saw in the French songs like Tant que Vivre, that we saw in Fratula, like El Grillo of Josquin, El Grillo, El Grillo Boncantore, that one with all the patter, Dali Beve, Grillo Canta, uh, to bring that together with, um, with sophisticated texts. And so we're kind of merging a l musical forms that used to be considered lighter with uh, very high-minded texts. And so the text might come from uh, Petrarch, um, who set the text to uh, Nono Solomonte. Uh, it might come from any number of very important Italian um, poets. And when you listen to this, so we're going to end now, but when you listen to this on your own, try to hear how he tries to bring out individual words. In particular, how does at the end, and a thousand deaths I would die, or a thousand deaths, how is that set? And this, it's great that we're going to divide the class here so that you can really put one like one database, one mental storage unit for the idea that the magical began as an attempt to bring very sophisticated texts and treat them very seriously in music. This magical is written about 1538. So we've jumped, we've been jumping forward and backward throughout the 16th century today, but we jumped backwards to do the magical. Because keep that brain cell, keep that area really separate from when you listen to the other setting of Il Bianco Dolce Cino written at the end of the century when the madrigal becomes a place to do the silliest things possible with texts and to not respect the text and, to, and later to get very, very bad texts that let you do whatever you want musically. So we're going to go in two classes from the madrigal being a very serious, sophisticated genre to the madrigal being a lot of fun. And that's where we'll continue next Tuesday. Um, feel free to keep emailing me with questions about papers, drafts, things, um, and I look forward to reading them. Thank you.